All right, open your Bibles to 1 John chapter number 4, if you would please. 1 John chapter number 4. Last week we talked about the command to love, the direction of love, and the need for love. And I'm talking about biblical love, one to another. Tonight we're going to kind of continue that theme and talk about authentic love. And so if you have 1 John chapter number 4, if you'll look down to verse 7 with me, uh, we'll read just a few verses and then get into the study for tonight. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Again, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing tonight upon your word as we uh, think about some thoughts. What is real, authentic love? If we're commanded to show love, if we're told to show love, if we're told to love one another, then what is it? Uh, and how do, how do we know and recognize that reality? So we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. When we think of love, there's one particular day that in the calendar that we kind of look at. What day would that be? What? Valentine's Day. All right. Now, some believe it's a made-up holiday established for florists, jewelers, and candy manufacturers, but not really. They have just exploited that, ad, that day, as they have many other sp very special days. According to the encyclopedia, St. Valentine's Day is a holiday honoring lovers. Celebrated February 14th by the custom of sending greeting cards or gifts to express affection. These little cards, known as valentines, are often designed with hearts to symbolize love. Now, this is not a Valentine's Day sermon. It just sounds like one. The holiday probably derives from the ancient Roman feast of Lupercalis, February 15th. And the fest festival gradually became associated with the uh, feast day of February 14th uh, of two Roman martyrs, both named St. Valentine, who lived in the third century. St. Valentine was, tra uh, uh, has tra traditionally been regarded as a patron saint of lovers. But knowing the history and the origin of the holiday, doesn't bring us any closer to answering the real question. What is real love? Now, I found some interesting thoughts. I love the thoughts of kids. Sometimes they, they can say uh, uh, some strange things. How many remember Art Linkletter and the kids? See, the rest of you are too young to know those things. But uh, uh, he used to ask kids and and he'd say, kids say the darndest things. Well, they do say some strange things. So here's some thoughts by children on the subject of love. Why does love happen between two particular people? I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, but the rest isn't supposed to be so painful. What is falling in love like? If falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it. It takes too long. What do most people do on a date? On the first date, they just tell each other lies 
And that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. When is it okay to kiss someone? You should never kiss a girl unless you have enough bucks to buy her a big ring and her own VCR because you'll want to have videos of the wedding. What is the proper age to get married? 84. Because at that age, you don't have to work anymore. You can spend all your time loving each other. But we'll turn to the real source of love for an accurate and clear understanding of all things uh, that God has to say in His Word. With the pages of the Bible, we can find the meaning of authentic love. Now, there's a declaration of it here in verse 7 and verse 8. Uh, first of all, it says that God is love. These three little words are profound into, uh, in the idea that they speak to us of the very essence of God. He is love. Now, we know that he loves, but that is what he does. This verse speak, uh, speaks of who he is, not of what he does. His very nature, the Bible teaches us, is of love. Note the impact of that simple statement. God's very nature is love. Therefore, if a person loves God, listen to what the scripture said here. If a person loves God, he will become a loving person because as he grows, he begins to take the very nature of God upon himself. That's why uh, the scripture says, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Because if I love God, if I have a relationship with him that draws me close to him, I want to be like him. I want to care. I want to be concerned. It's natural that we do so. It's a, a simple statement, but it's a profound statement. If a person really loves God, he does what God does, and God loves, the scripture says. He loves how many? Everyone. God so loved the world, that's everyone, that he gave his only begotten son. When we love one another, people will see two things. When we love one another, now we're talking within the Christian body. But when we love one another, people will see that we are born of God, that God has made a change in our life. It is not a natural thing for us to love everybody. Did you ever meet somebody that wasn't very lovable? I've seen a few of those, haven't you? But I'm still commanded to love them. God loved them, didn't he? He didn't have any exclusions. And if I take the nature of God, I will do what God does. I will love them. So people see a change in us, that we are born of God. They see that we have the nature of God, that God has put his divine nature in us through the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of his word, and our closeness to him, we become like him. So how do they see his nature in us? It's simple, by our love for others. Jesus said it this way in John 13, in verse 35, he said, by this shall all men know that you are my, my disciples if you have love one to another. That love is evidence of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. They see us doing the very same thing that God does. He loves them. He cares about them. You know, Sometimes 
we like to tell people that we love God. But then our actions toward them say, well, I really don't love God because I'm not like him and God loved me and you don't love me. You don't care for me. But our actions would be different because we'd be like him. They would see us loving the poor as he loved them and the healthy and loving the suffering and the deserving and the undeserving, the acceptable and the unacceptable, the good and the bad. In other words, they see us loving others no matter who or what they may be. People see that we know God then. They see that we've been talking to God, learning about God, and that we're doing what God says, carrying out his instructions. They see that we know God and fellowship and commune with him. They see it, and as a result, we're living godly lives. Sin is put away from us, and we are actually taking on the very nature of God. Well, how do they see all that? Those processes don't go through their mind, but they see it by our love, by our action. They see that we're loving and caring, not, uh, our, not just like the world does, but just as God does, is loving and caring. So in the scripture here, we have the demonstration of authentic love in verse 9 and verse 10. Whosoever is born of God doth not, uh, uh, excuse me, I better get to the right chapter uh, here. Uh, in this was manifested uh, the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here's the demonstration of love from God. He sent his son. When God provided our salvation, he gave us our his very best. When Jesus came, God didn't look down and say, wow, this thing got out of control. They, they nailed him to a cross. No, that was the plan of God for our redemption from before the foundation of the world. God sent his son and provided salvation for us. Uh, John 3.16, uh, most of you can quote it, but it talks about for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only begotten, his one and only son. There never had been one like him, and there never will be another like him. So why did God give his only begotten son? It's so that we might live through him so that we can be born again, so that we can be saved, so our sins can be forgiven, and so we can have that love relationship with God. And that was the only possible way for us to have that. Again, most of you know John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way possible to have that relationship with God was through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he came and he paid all the price. Verse 10 says uh, he was the propitiation uh, for our sins. The word propitiation uh, literally means a satisfactory payment. Uh, uh, and it can mean a bloody sacrifice for that payment. Jesus is the only one who could pay the price and redeem the souls of mankind. And the reason was, he's the only one that never sinned. You and I could not do so because we started out very early as a baby line, didn't we? 
We cried when we didn't really have any problem. We just wanted the attention. No one ever taught me how to lie when I was a little kid. It just came natural. It came from the flesh. No one taught me how to be selfish with my uh, friend's toys. You know, a child, it doesn't matter what, how many toys they've got. If somebody else has got one, they've got to have that one. You know how that goes. No one ever teaches those things. We try to unteach them, don't we? But the reality is those are part of our nature. So we couldn't pay the price. I couldn't do for myself anything that would earn God's respect and God's love. But Jesus did it for me and for you. This was his purpose for coming in the first place. And Jesus fulfilled that purpose, task, perfectly. He did exactly what he was asked to do by his father. And he finished the task. The last words of Jesus on the cross were, it is finished. Now, some people look at that and say, okay, he's dying. He said, my life is over. But what he is simply saying is, the reason that I came, the purpose for coming is complete. I finished the task. So what was finished? The plan and purpose of Almighty God. Christ's death on the cross was a perfect demonstration of authentic love. And then we see a directive of love in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. God in his great love for us set an example. He shows us what we should be. Then he calls upon us to love one another in the same manner. Now here's what love does. It always moves to act. It will show itself if it's really there. Now, over the years, I've done a lot of marital counseling. And I can tell you that most of that counseling has to do with the fact that somebody doesn't know how to show the other person that they love them. And it may be they're selfish. It may be they're rebellious. But there's a reason that people have problems. Especially in this society, we've learned it's so easy to get out of things that we've forgotten that we have to put an effort into loving. I have to do something. It always acts. It did with God. God so loved the world that he gave. You know, if I love my wife, I do things for her. If she loves me, she does things for me. But if I don't love her like I should, I'll do things for me and she'll do things for herself. And we'll forget about each other and eventually grow apart. Well, if we don't listen to God's love and we don't give back to him of our time and our tithe and our talent, we'll forget about his love and eventually pull away from him also. But God loved and he gave. God commended, commended his love, showed his love, in other words, to us, uh, toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But if we've known God and his love, then we are to show that to others. God expects, and we should, reveal his nature to others through what we do and how we live. So how do we love as God loved? First of all, authentic love seeks the best interest of others. Real, authentic love seeks the best interest of others. Now, that can be helping people with a problem. 
that can be strengthening in, in a time of need. But there are other ways that we can show uh, that love. Uh, what's the best interest of a lost person? They may not understand it, but that they get born again so they can go to heaven. Real love will share the gospel, will share that good news. That will be nature. Authentic love always takes the initiative. We don't sit back and say, well, that person doesn't deserve it. If I really love as God loves, I will take the initiative. Some people, I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to forgive them until they come and apologize. You know who got hurt in that deal, don't you? Because you carry the bitterness, you carry the anger. But the thing that God says we're to do is to love them. You know, I think I remember the Word of God says something strange. Now, surely I couldn't be right. Surely the Scripture didn't say, love your enemies, did it? Oh, it did. Wow. That's not human nature, is it? That's the godly nature that's imparted to us. And that will take the initiative. Authentic love is self-sacrificial. It doesn't have to have me first. Others first. That's authentic love. So let's stop saying we love others and really show it by our actions. God gave us an example in Luke chapter 15. You'll be familiar with the story. It's the story about the prodigal son. Like most fathers, this father loved his sons. He wanted the best for them. One son demanded his inheritance and went his own way. In other words, he said, in our language, Pop, I don't want to wait for you to die. Give it to me now. And his father in love gave it to him. But the father never stopped loving his son, though his son left him and there was no relationship. One day, the son decided to return to his father's house as a servant because he had wasted all of his money. And now, no friends left eating with the hogs. He said, I'll go back. And he did with a repentant attitude to his father's house. He told his father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just make me a servant. But the father received him back as a son. His son was restored into that rightful position in the household. But that's how God actually treats us. If you as a believer have gone your own way, God's desire is still that you come home. And God will always be waiting for you because God is love. And that love never dies no matter what we do. Every now and you hear somebody say, well, I'm never going to speak to my dad again or I haven't spoke to my mom for uh, years and years and years because of. That's not love. Love never fails according to the scripture for the Christian. That's one of the things that God says in 1 Corinthians 13. Charity never, or love, never faileth. I don't give up. You should not give up on those around you. God still loves them, so we should still love them.
He'll always welcome us, welcome us back as we humbly return with a repentant attitude and he'll lift us up and like the prodigal, restore him, store us to our position. So if there are those here who have strayed from God's side, why not come home? The Father's waiting for you. Maybe you've come to the place that you're tired like this prodigal son of what the world has to author and offer and found that it's not satisfying. Come home. He'll welcome you with open arms. Do we love God as God has shown us? We note Paul's prayer for believers in Thessalonica. Here's what he said in closing. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Notice Paul's prayer was this, that the Lord increase your love to make you abound in love one toward another. God's people ought to love one another. And then he says, and toward all men outside of these walls, the love of God should be seen in our lives. If it's authentic, it will be seen. People will see it. Let's stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one's looking around. If you've wandered away from the Lord, maybe it's time to come back. This matter of love may be an indication of where you stand with the Lord and your relationship with Him. Here's a place to come home. If you've never been saved, here's a place to come uh, to this altar. Someone will pray with you and show you how to be saved. But as God speaks to your heart, respond to His call and respond to His love. Heavenly Father, as we conclude the service with a verse of invitation hymn, we ask that your will be done in our lives. We thank you for those who have come tonight and ask you to bless each person here. Help them to go away with the closeness to you that that love that you've shown toward us, that very nature of you is evident from our lives, our care, and our concern. And we'll give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen.